Jesus, the hope of the world. This is part one. Uh, this is the first Sunday of Advent season, and we're going to pause our series on Joseph in order to focus in on Advent. Now, we did, uh, we were supposed to bring a wreath today, uh, the Advent wreath. We were going to light the first candle. Lisa went to Hobby Lobby and everything and made her own wreath for us, but it doesn't do no good at home. But, but anyway, the first candle is called the prophecy candle. It's also called the, can the candle of hope. And so I was going to originally do one sermon for each of the candles, but then as I got into uh, more and more into thinking about hope, I think I'm just going to stay with hope. We're going to talk a lot about hope. If ever we needed hope, it's in uh, our day and our culture. Uh, when it seems like everything's going downhill, everything's going uh, uh, spiraling down out of control, we need to be reminded of the promises of God. We need, need to be reminded that there is hope. He sent Jesus into the world to be our living hope. So we're going from the Old Testament Joseph, the son of Jacob, to the New Testament Joseph and Mary and Jesus, uh, obviously, specifically Jesus. I want to begin this series by tying together what we're seeing in our series on Joseph in the Old Testament to this four-part Advent short series. The main thing we have been seeing in the story of Joseph is what Paul says in Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That means that bad things happen. Bad things happen, but even bad things are included in Paul's all things that eventually and ultimately work together for good. And not for everybody, just for those who are called according to his purpose. A lot of bad things happen to Joseph in the Old Testament, but eventually... And a little bit of this will be a spoiler alert, but most of you are familiar with the story of Joseph anyways. Eventually, we discover that what everyone meant evil for him, God actually meant it for good. Joseph ends up, in a sense, saving the world by providing bread in a world famine. The next chapter in our Joseph series is all about the baker and the cup bearer that Joseph meets while he's in prison. And I love the next chapter. I can't wait to get back to the Joseph series because that's a, that's a good, uh, I love that part of the story with the baker and the cup bearer. If Joseph is all about Jesus, what do you think the baker and the cup bearer point forward to? The sacramental bread and wine of the new covenant. And of course, the bread and wine represent the body and blood of Jesus. So the story of Joseph becomes a story about bread in more than one way. After correctly interpreting the dreams of the cupbearer cup and baker, Joseph later on ends up interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh himself. Pharaoh's dreams are interpreted by Joseph to be about seven years of plenty in Egypt and then seven years of famine in the world. During the seven years of plenty, Joseph stores up grain in a great, it says in Genesis 41, 49, he stores up grain in great abundance like the sand of the sea until he ceased to measure it for it could not be measured. He has so much grain stored up, it's like the sand of the sea. He gives up on measuring how much he has. Because of Joseph, Egypt was ready for a great famine that, do, that did indeed come. Genesis 41, 53 through 57 says this, The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth, all the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. So Joseph 
provided bread in a worldwide famine. Jesus, when he comes, says that he is the bread from heaven. John 6, 31. It says, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never, shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then a few verses later in that chapter, John 6, verse 41, says, So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. We all know that the Christmas story took place. I just remembered I was going to have uh, William do a slide. If I emailed you something right now, would you be able to Put it up on the screen or not? You would? Can I preach an email at the same time? <laughs> we all know the story of the Christmas story, right? Don't pay attention to what I'm doing. Well, it's a story that takes place in Bethlehem. How about we just pause for a second? Is that okay? Never mind. I'll just do without it. Okay. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> What's that? Are you saying something to me? <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, it's just a chiasm. I'll just tell you what it says. We'll, that's fine. Uh, we all know where it took place, right? It begins in Bethlehem. But of all the cities and towns and villages in Israel, why did God choose Bethlehem? Why did he choose such an obscure town as Bethlehem for the birth of the Savior of the world? God picked Bethlehem to be the most important birthplace in history. It was this small town where men would first see God in the flesh. John 14, 7, Jesus said, if you, had seen, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. But why Bethlehem? There are other cities that seem like would be a better choice. For instance, why not Jerusalem? Jerusalem was the center of religious and civil life in Israel. The temple was there. The palace was there. It seems like Jerusalem would be the perfect place to welcome the long-awaited king of Israel. But Bethlehem was chosen by God instead. He didn't pick Jerusalem or Rome or Athens or Alexandria. He didn't pick any political, commercial, cultural, educational, or socially significant city of the day. He picked Bethlehem. And God doesn't do things randomly. That's like saying he picked White City, right? It's just this little town. Oh, sorry, you guys live there. I got to pick a little town where no one lives. God doesn't do things randomly. He does things on purpose. He's intentional about every detail of history. The ancient prophet Micah himself in Micah 5 2 said Bethlehem was, quote, too little to be among the clans of Judah. It's just too little, puny little town. 
just a one small, one stoplight town. And this idea of obscurity is captured in the well-known Christmas song. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above the deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And check out uh, more of the prophecy that I just quoted from Micah 5. Uh, I quoted verse 2, but let's read verses 1 through 4. Micah 5, verse 1 through 4. It says, Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel in the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of Yahweh, in the majesty of the name of Yahweh his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. So Micah, this is long before Jesus was born, the prophet Micah says, a ruler would come out of Bethlehem, a ruler whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Micah says that Israel would suffer without a king until the king was born. He claimed that the greatness of this king would reach to the ends of the earth. And it says that he will come out of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Jesus, because of this prophecy, he had to be born in Bethlehem. This was one of the many evidences that he was the promised Messiah. It was not just a random fact about Jesus. It was fulfilled prophecy about the king who would come and whose greatness would reach the ends of the earth. There's a reason the star was shining over Bethlehem. And not only did it happen in a seemingly insignificant tiny town, but it happened in this trough, in this stable. The definition, I've said this before, you guys I'm sure have heard me talk about this before, because I talk about it usually at communion time during Advent season. But the definition of Bethlehem, in Hebrew, Bethlehem is from two words, and it means house, as in Bethel, Bethel, which means house of God, El meaning God, and like in the term El Shaddai, God Almighty. So Beth meaning house, and uh, El meaning God. So uh, Bethlehem means house of God and bread. Literally means the house of bread, the house of bread or house of food. So Bethlehem can also mean, uh, house in the Hebrew can be translated, can be used for body as well. They're interchange interchangeably, house and bread, or house and body, and bread is interchangeable with food. So you can take this to mean house of the food of God, or body of God become food, body of God become bread. That's just in the name Bethlehem. Body of God become bread, or food. Then it says in Micah there, it says Bethlehem Ephrata. What is Ephrata? It's an, that, that name is an earlier, another name for Bethlehem. It's an earlier name for the town of Bethlehem. And it means ash heap, and it means place of fruitfulness. Ephrata, ash heap, place of fruitfulness. Doesn't that seem like kind of a contradiction? In, it's two different things. Ash heap, place of fruitfulness. Ash heap is something that is burned into nothing but ashes. Death, you know, ashes to ashes. And place of fruitfulness points to new life, new life. So the name Ephrata can mean new life out of death, new life out of death. So what happens when, you, when Micah put those two names together? Together, Bethlehem Ephrata, the body of God become bread to create new life out of death. That's in the simple title of that town, Bethlehem Ephrata. Body of God become bread to create new life out of death. The birth of Jesus is in the place of new birth. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, house of bread, 
or body of God become food. He died on the cross in order for his body to become food or bread broken for us. Broken for us. Out of his death came life to feed a hungry and hopeless world. Remember, we're talking about Jesus, the hope of the world. And it keeps getting better. Not only was Bethlehem a tiny little town, Jesus was placed in a feeding trough for animals. We hear the word manger, we don't think of it as a feeding trough for animals, but that's exactly what it was. So in the house of bread, the body of God became food in order to bring new life out of death, and as a baby was placed in a feeding trough made for animals. In Bethlehem, the great shepherd was placed in a feeding trough, and through his death, he became food for his sheep and for the world. The shepherd became food for the sheep. The shepherd became food for the sheep. But there's also another story in the Old Testament that involves Bethlehem as well. Another story that takes place in Bethlehem. And it fits perfectly into the whole greater redemptive picture of history where Jesus is the hope of the world. And it also ties into this bread and famine theme. And it's from the story of Ruth. And I'm just going to read Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then we'll talk about it. Ruth 1, starting in verse 1. So if you want to read along, Ruth chapter 1. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah, a man of Bethlehem in Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These two Moabite, these took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years. And both Malan and Chilion died, so that the woman, the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that Yahweh had visited his people and given them food. So she's in the fields of Moab, and she got word that God's people had food again. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return, each of you, to her mother's house. May Yahweh deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Yahweh grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, We will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me For your sake, that the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. And and she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May Yahweh do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, 
for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and Yahweh has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when Yahweh has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Notice the, the hopelessness of Naomi when she returns to, to Bethlehem. Also notice that chapter 1 begins and ends with, in Bethlehem, and it also begins with a famine, and it ends with a harvest. And of course, when you see the beginning of a chapter and the end of a chapter that are similar, you think, I bet there's a chiasm in there. There's, there's, there must be that structure. And this is the chiasm. See, there it is. That's all you get. Ruth 1, chiasm. So it begins at the top. I'll just explain it to you. The top of the, chop, top of the chapter is famine. The bottom is barley harvest. And the, the next one, that's A. B is the top is immigration, E-M-I-G-R-A-T-I-O-N. Immigration, not immigration, but emigration, which to, from Bethlehem, it's not where you're going somewhere, you're, you're leaving somewhere. So it's emigration from Bethlehem, and then the bottom is immigration to Bethlehem. And then the next one is Naomi equals pleasant, and then Mara equals bitter, and then D is leaving Moab for Bethlehem, and D prime is, at the end is entering Bethlehem from Moab. And then F is Na Naomi kisses Orpah and Ruth goodbye. And then the, at the bottom F is Orpah kisses Naomi goodbye. And the two Gs in the middle all weep loudly. And at the very center of the chiasm, and that's the point of chiasms, uh, the literary structure of the chiasms is everything points to the center. It points to the middle of the chiasm. And at the very middle, you... Uh, this is not exactly what she says, but it's a summary of what she says. Is It's in verses 11 through 13. She says, I am too old to conceive, basically. She's saying, I am too old to conceive. So that whole chapter is structured in a way that points to the fact that she's too old to conceive. The womb, it highlights a womb that is basically barren, a womb that is basically without hope. She doesn't say, I'm too old to conceive, that's basically what she means. She says, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they are grown? So she said, I, I'm too old. I'm not going to get married. And even if I got married today, and even if I got pregnant today, are you going to wait around for them to grow up and then have uh, husbands? So there, it highlights the barren womb. Obviously pointing us to Jesus and the, the virgin womb, the virgin birth of Jesus. In the book of Ruth, we see a sharp contrast between covenantal faithfulness or faithlessness and covenantal faithfulness. Uh, Elimelech was a faithless man. He rejected the covenant, the covenant people, and the covenant land. He sought the blessing of the covenant outside of the covenant context. So he leaves his people. He leaves... Uh, uh, Bethlehem. He leaves the, the land of God, the promised land. And then Ruth is a pagan, a Moabite, and she receives covenant and accepts the covenant consequences and becomes faithful to the covenant. And we also see the theme of life within the covenant and death outside of the covenant. And we also see Bethlehem is actually a small-scale version of the whole world. Bethlehem is the house of bread, and that actually points us all back to the Garden of Eden where food was available within covenant faithfulness. Later, God placed his people into a land flowing with milk and honey, with plenty of food. So Bethlehem becomes, becomes a prophetic living picture of the restored Garden of Eden. And the first thing we see in Ruth is that the house of bread is out of bread. There's famine, famine in the land. And, and notice the book begins with, in the days when the judges ruled. That points us to the book of Judges, and that was not a good time. The, when the days when the judges ruled, Judges 21, 25 says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
in God's covenant community, everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. They're doing their own thing. They're ignoring God. They're rebelling against God. Antinomianism and autonomy reigned in the land. Yahweh was no longer being regarded as king. And as a result, we see God always promised in, in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, there's blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. And as a result of this rebellion, there was famine in the land. That's a covenantal curse. And during this famine and in this chaos, there was a husband and a wife, Elimelech and Naomi. They had two sons, Malan and Chilion. With Malan means sick, weak, and diseased. And Chilion means pining and wasting away. So Elimelech is a man of Bethlehem, the house of bread, in Judah, the royal tribe. But Elimelech, like everyone else, decides to do what's right in his own eyes. So he packs their bags, takes his wife, Naomi, and the two sons, weak and wasting away, with them. And they move to the pagan country of Moab. He decides to leave the covenantal land, covenantal people, and it's all because of food. How many people even today move to a place where there's no covenant community, no church, only because of a job? Elimelech leaves the house of bread, the place where God dwells. He leaves the body of God become food in order to get food from the table and land of the Moabites, of all people, the Moabites. And I'm sure he had a very good spin to rationalize his decision. I'm a provider. I need to take care of my family. What he failed to acknowledge was that famine in the land was an obvious sign of God's judgment on the land, especially famine in the land flowing with milk and honey, especially famine in the house of bread, Bethlehem. So Elimelech, leaving the covenant land, is, is a picture of apostasy. It's ironic that he picks Moab because Moab had a history of not giving bread to God's people a specific history of not giving bread to God's people. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of Yahweh, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of Yahweh forever because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Pethor, of Mesopotamia to curse you. So Elimelech is basically an idiot to choose to choose the land of Moab because of food. He takes his family and leaves the house of bread to go to the people who refused to give bread to the people of Israel when they were going to the promised land. What did they do? They hired Balaam to curse Israel. So Let's see. So now in the book of Ruth, Elimelech leaves the house of bread, lets his two sons, weak and wasting away, marry Moabite women, and then God kills all of them, kills all the him and his two sons. And it's also ironic that Elimelech means God is king. His name means God is king. And instead, he did what was right in his own eyes, like the rest of Israel was doing. He could have recognized that God was king, and the fact that, that the famine was in the land was because of sin and rebellion against the king of kings. Instead of repenting and preaching repentance to his fellow Israelites, he packs up his family and leaves. So after they, they get to Moab, Elimelech dies. Naomi's left with her two sons. The boys marry two Moabite women. Then the two sons die. Now it's just Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. In verses 6 and 7, she hears that bread had returned to the house of bread, Bethlehem. Orpah ends up staying in Moab, but Ruth ends up going with Naomi. They arrive in Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. The beginning of barley harvest is Passover. And then you all know the rest of the story. Uh, she's gleaning in the fields, and she happens to be in, in uh, Boaz's uh, on his farm, with his uh, field, and uh, and he sees her, and, and the rest, you know, is history. And then there's this leveret marriage thing, the term, uh, or kinsman redeemer. Boaz happens to be her kinsman redeemer, Naomi's kinsman redeemer. 
which is part of the leveret marriage law in God's law. The term is derived from the Latin word lever, meaning brother-in-law. Leveret marriage takes place when a man dies with no male children. His brother or another relative is to marry the widow and father a son for the deceased brother. It's the practice of raising up a son for a deceased relative. In the leveret marriage, the first son born is considered to be the son of the dead brother. And when this son grows up, he'll inherit the property of the deceased father. And the law wasn't compulsory. It wasn't where they had to do it. A brother or relative could choose not to fulfill his duty. In fact, that's what happens in the story of Ruth and Naomi. Uh, a brother or relative could not do it, but if they did refuse, uh, they would be encouraged to change their mind, and if they still refused, they'd be shamed with a ceremony with a sandal and spitting in the face. It's a, a whole thing. So the word kinsman, redeemer, the Hebrew word is ga'al, ga'al. Kinsman, redeemer is translated from that one word. The kinsman is who the man is. He's a relative. The Redeemer is what the man does. And there's three basic kinds of kinsman Redeemer. The first two are found in Leviticus 25. Number one is redemption of property. The kinsman acts on behalf of an impoverished relative to purchase and return the land the poor man was forced to sell. He, the kinsman, redeems or buys back the land. The second kind of kinsman Redeemer is the redemption of a person. A person. Here we see that the kinsman redeems a relative who was forced to sell himself into slavery. He buys him out of slavery and sets him free. And the third kind is the redemption of blood. And that's in Numbers 35. And here we see that the Gaal is an avenger. When a relative of his, his is murdered, as the kinsman redeemer, he's to avenge the death. It's his duty as Gaal to protect the honor of the family and exact vengeance. So Elimelech is the first Adam, you could say. He's the first Adam. Boaz is the second Adam. Elimelech is the apostate husband who leaves the covenant. Children of the first Adam are weak and wasting away. They're under a curse. Boaz is the faithful husband who keeps covenant. Children of this Adam become the royal line of the covenant people of God. So let's just peek ahead to chapter 4 of Ruth and see what happened. Chapter 4, verse 9 says this, Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are my witnesses this day that I have bought you from the, the hand of Naomi, all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have, brought to be, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place, you are witnesses this day. And then in verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, and when, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and lay him on her lap and became his nurse. And the woman of the neighborhood, the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is all pointing to Jesus. It's all pointing to the incarnation, to that first Christmas. We're all in a helpless and hopeless state. We're weak, sick, and wasting away. We're in a debt that unable to pay our way out of it. We're starving. There's famine in the land. We're without hope. So we're out of covenant, looking for bread in all the wrong places. We hear that in Bethlehem, bread has come. Advent means coming, the coming of bread. Bread has come to Bethlehem, the house of bread. Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, makes a covenant with a Moabitess, a foreigner, the wife of sickness and disease, and gives covenant loyalty and love. 
That's all gospel stuff. That's all pointing to Jesus. Obed, then they have Obed. Little Obed at the end of Ruth is born. He's Obed has Jesse, and, and Jesse has David. Guess where David was born? Bethlehem. David's born in Bethlehem. From Boaz to David to Jesus, all born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Ruth comes to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest, the Passover, and she is re- she, she's redeemed by Boaz at the end of the wheat harvest, Pentecost. Jesus is our Gaal, our kinsman redeemer. There was one more person who was a closer relative than Boaz. Boaz had to go to him and ask him if he would redeem Ruth. Basically, he says he couldn't or he wouldn't do it. That's a picture, I think, of the law. The law cannot redeem us. The first Gaal is not enough to save us. Jesus steps in as our Gaal to redeem us from sin, sickness, death, and wasting away. He's the kinsman redeemer who comes to Bethlehem. He's the body of God become food, lying in a feeding trough in the house of bread. Isaiah 44, 6, and verse 22 through 24 says, Thus says Yahweh, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for Yahweh has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For Yahweh has redeemed Jacob. Every time he uses the word redeemed, it's Ga'al, the redeemer. And will be glorified in Israel. Thus Yahweh, your redeemer, Ga'al, who formed you from the womb. I am Yahweh who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens and spread out the earth by myself. In Isaiah 54, 5, it says, For your maker is your husband, Yahweh of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, your Gaal, the God of the whole earth, he is called. Yahweh says over and over that he is the Gaal. He promised to redeem his people, purchases her with his blood. This all takes place in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is what we celebrate every Lord's Day at the Lord's table. The body of God made bread. He's the manna, the living bread from heaven. But just as Joseph gave bread in a worldwide famine, Jesus gives hope to a hopeless world. Jesus was the promised hope for the world, not just to Israel, to Israel. Every tribe, tongue, and language, every nation, all the Gentiles, the whole world. Paul makes this point very clear in Romans 15. Listen to what he says in Romans 15, starting in verse 8. And he just quotes a whole bunch of prophecies from the Old Testament. He says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised. That's talking about Israelites. He became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order to in order that the gentiles might glorify god for his mercy as it is written therefore i will praise you among the gentiles and sing to your name gentiles means the nations all the other non-israelite nations he continues in verse 10 and again it's it is said rejoice o gentiles with his people and again praise the lord all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. That's the word advent. That's where we get the word advent means come. The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Jesus came as light into a dark world and as bread into a worldwide famine to give hope to the whole wide world. John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved 
the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for not leaving this world in darkness. Thank you for sending your Son into this dark world. Thank you for sending the bread, the living bread from heaven, into a worldwide famine. In your light, Lord, we see light. Let us not love the darkness, but love one another. And so let your light shine through our lives. Go with us in this new week and let your light shine through us. May our Advent season be saturated in gratitude for you and the gift of your Son to the world. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.